Muito bem, então, uma boa tarde a todas e todos, sejam todos e todas muito bem-vindos e bem-vindas à 18ª Semana da Imagem da Comunicação, uma iniciativa do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências da Comunicação da Unicinos, mais especificamente da linha de pesquisa Mídias e Processos Audiovisuais. Meu nome é Gustavo Dalt Fischer, sou professor do VPG em Comunicação, e juntamente com meus colegas Suzana Kilp, Sônia Montânio, Tiago Lopes e os nossos alunos de mestrado e doutorado, organizamos mais uma edição da Semana da Imagem. É um evento já bastante é, tradicional aqui no nosso programa e dentro da própria Unicinos, na Escola da Indústria Criativa. Nós integramos o grupo de pesquisa Audiovisualidade e Tecnocultura, Comunicação, Memória e Design. Esse, programa de, esse grupo de pesquisa, que é vinculado ao nosso PPG, ele tem é, o seu Facebook e o seu YouTube, de onde vocês estão assistindo hoje e vão assistir ao longo dos quatro dias do nosso evento, é, as nossas palestras, os debates, e farão os comentários que serão levados até os nossos uh, palestrantes ao longo desses quatro dias. É, estamos muito contentes de poder é, retomar a ideia da Semana da Imagem 2020, após um período de adaptação em relação às circunstâncias da pandemia do Covid-19. Nossa programação incluía a Semana da Imagem ocorrendo presencialmente no mês de março, e também com a participação do professor Peter Krepp, da Universidade de Califórnia Irvine, participação essa que ainda foi possível lá em março, mas depois tivemos que modificar as nossas circunstâncias. Embora isso também favoreça né, a possibilidade de a gente ter mais gente aí podendo é, assistir o nosso evento, que normalmente se dirige aos alunos de pós-graduação e graduação dos cursos da Escola da Indústria Criativa. Portanto, além do dia de hoje, onde iniciamos o nosso trabalho, nós também temos transmissão amanhã, quarta-feira e quinta, sempre às 17 horas até às 19 horas. É importante mencionar que esse evento, ele conta com o apoio da CAPES e também da FAPERGS, as duas agências que colaboram para a realização é, deste evento. Nessa parte inicial, antes da gente é, receber e, e assistir a apresentação do nosso convidado, o professor Xavier Reis, da, de Manchester, é, nós vamos inicialmente pedir para, e já agradecendo a nossa professora Ana Paula da Rosa, coordenadora do PPG em Ciências da Comunicação, para saudar a todos aqui no início do nosso evento. Ana Paula, muito obrigado pela presença. Olá, boa tarde a todos. Em nome do PPG em Ciências da Comunicação, eu gostaria de destacar a importância de mais uma Semana da Imagem, esse evento que já integra, assim como o Gustavo mencionou, o calendário do PPG e também da própria instituição. Eu agradeço e parabenizo a Suzana, o Gustavo, a Sônia e o Tiago pela organização desse evento e também a todos os alunos da linha 1 pelo seu engajamento. A temática desse evento neste ano, né, é muito especial entre arquivar e experimentar na tecnocultura, né, uma provocação muito pertinente nesse momento, quando nós temos à mão as possibilidades tão infinitas de arquivos, de memória, que muitas vezes não nos cabem, mas, por outro lado, no entanto, experimentar, viver, sentir, nunca foi tão necessário e urgente como é nesse momento. Então, eu desejo a vocês um ótimo evento de muitas experiências e que elas possam gerar arquivos uh, de significado muito profundo para todos vocês. Um ótimo evento a todos. Ana, muito obrigado pelas suas palavras. Lembraste muito bem que eu acabei passando aqui o nosso tema esse ano, né, entre arquivar e experimentar na tecnocultura. É um tema que nos é muito caro em função das pesquisas que desenvolvemos e a oportunidade de encontrar colegas, parceiros de diversos Aí do Brasil e do mundo, é muito importante nesse sentido. Antes da gente dar continuidade, eu também quero saudar e passar a palavra para a nossa professora Suzana Kilp, é a nossa líder do grupo de pesquisa audiovisualidade e tecnocultura, e também da Semana da Imagem e da Comunicação, ainda em meados dos anos 90, é, no então Centro de Ciências da Comunicação da Unicinos. Suzana, muito obrigado, te passo a palavra. Ok, Gustavo, obrigada. A atenção a todos e a todas, eu vou abrir essa semana falando um pouco da Semana da Imagem, que foi um evento que começou na graduação, quando eu ainda estava na graduação, eu era professora e tínhamos um grupo de pesquisa, um grupo de pesquisa em imagens na comunicação, e resolvemos fazer esse evento voltado para os alunos da graduação. 
foi, a, foi o primeiro evento em que acadêmico em que se uh, que, que se ofereceu a, aos aos alunos e professores da graduação ele teve uma série de de, de, de eventos ano a ano e foi descontinuado depois de um certo tempo e de, quando depois na, em paralelo ou depois depois da semana da imagem veio o grupo da imagem uh, esse grupo começou com aí já estávamos na, na pós graduação e esse grupo ele tinha como título uh, metodologias de pesquisa e experimentação em audiovisual então era um grupo de pesquisa de, de métodos e de, de experimentação nós pretendíamos fa fazer um, um grupo de experiências de experimentação Bom, esse grupo não, não, ele andou um pouco e não, ele era muito grande, muito largo, não deu certo. Nós transformamos ele, então, num grupo chamado Audiovisualidades, TK, é, GEPAF, GEPAF. O, o grupo de audiovisualidades que promoveu um, um famoso encontro, um, um PA chamado de audiovisualidades, que reunia várias atividades diferentes, e, e foi assim que se começou este grupo. Este grupo tinha várias outras pessoas fazendo parte dele, e também houve um momento em que ele ele precisou transcender-se. E nós pensamos assim, nós estávamos trabalhando muito com uh, Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, e a questão da cultura e da tecnocultura era uma coisa muito cara para nós, assim como a questão da, das audiovisualidades. <coughs> As audiovisualidades são, são virtualidades audiovisuais, não são, não são um cinema, não são um teatro, não são a TV, não são nada dessas mídias. Mas há, em todas as mídias há audiovisualidades. Era isso que nós queríamos estudar, foi o que nós oferecemos para os alunos da graduação na ocasião uh, em que uh, fizemos o PA em audiovisualidades. Bom, e esse grupo, então, foi, chamado, foi transformado num... Ele, ele, ele surge como metodologia de pesquisa e experimentação em 2003. Depois ele foi transformado em audiovisualidades e tecnocultura, memória, comunicação, memória e design. E este grupo é o que tem funcionado até hoje, vamos dizer assim, às vezes melhor, às vezes pior, mas agora... Quando assumimos este grupo, assumimos também o evento. Foi neste momento em que o, a Semana da Imagem passou para pós-graduação. Eu acho que agora está na hora de nós mudarmos de novo. Estamos chegando perto de um novo estágio, nós temos nos valido assim, das coisas que nós aprendemos com nossos alunos, conosco mesmo, e nada mais justo do que ele agora se chamasse audiovisualidades da tecnocultura, comunicação, memória e design. Desapareceu essa injunção, essa, essa relação paralela do, das audiovisualidades e da tecnocultura e virou audiovisualidades da tecnocultura. Eu espero que a gente consiga levar adiante esse projeto e andando sempre na direção do melhor. Eu desejo a todos uma boa... Uma boa semana, bons, bom, Javier, boas 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 vindas. Gustavo, te devolvo a palavra. Muito bem, Suzana, muito obrigado. A pesquisa é viva e as nossas andanças por ela também, né? Então, a gente já fica de novo desafiado a seguir repensando esse nosso lugar de fala, que da tradição tem que buscar sempre a inovação. Muito obrigado. E agora eu vou passar para um, uma outra janela aqui para apresentar o Xavier, Uh, e dar início à nossa fala de hoje.
Olá. Hello, Xavier. Hi, boa tarde. Boa tarde. You doing fine over there? Yeah, all good. Thank okay. you. I'm going to present you now, but I'll say some more words in Portuguese, ok? Sure, go ahead. Então, gente, estamos então aqui para iniciar a nossa fala de hoje é, com o tema The What and Why of Found Footage Horror, com o professor Dr. Xavier Aldana Reis. Ele é da Universidade Metropolitana de Manchester. Ele é PhD em Literatura Inglesa pela Lancaster University em 2013 e mestre em Literatura Moderna e Contemporânea pelo Birkbeck College, University of London, em 2009. O Xavier, ele vem à Semana da Imagem de 2020, então, com o tema The What and Why of Found Footage Horror. Especialista em filmes, ficções góticas de terror, os seus interesses de pesquisa estão relacionados às teorias do cinema, teoria crítica e contemporânea do pós-guerra. Xavier também, o professor Xavier, é fundador do Centro de Estudos Góticos de Manchester, cujo objetivo é promover e divulgar o conhecimento do gótico por meio de pesquisas, aulas e eventos para a comunidade acadêmica, nacional e internacional. Uh, Xavier, I was just saying a couple of words about your, in a very short way, your long curriculum. So please feel free to present yourself once again, and then we'll go to your, your presentation. Um, I can understand most of that, which is <laughs> nice for me. <laughs> um, thank you about that. Um, <clears throat> I guess I should probably begin by just saying briefly how I came to film. Um, as part of my PhD, I began getting interested in fear and, and you know, how horror communicates all sorts of social and political fears. So uh, it was inevitable, I guess, that eventually I would turn to um, uh, found footage horror. So um, the talk that I'm giving today is really my uh, thoughts as of 2020. They've already sort of like uh, expanded a bit since I recorded this um, talk in um, March, I think it was. Um, so I look forward to the conversation, uh, both with you and uh, the students later. Thank you. Okay. Obrigado. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, então, ele mencionou que o interesse dele começa fortemente no período do doutorado e que, em função dessa fala, estava pronta em março já, né? E ele certamente tem várias coisas para atualizar, mas ele vai, gostar, ele vai gostar de ouvir muito né, as, as opiniões da gente à medida em que agora a gente vai assistir, então, o vídeo da fala do, do Xavier. Ele foi totalmente legendado aqui pelos nossos alunos aqui do é, da linha de pesquisa. Ele tem aproximadamente 50 minutos, tem bastante imagem, bastante texto, é uma série de exemplos, então é legal a gente uh, prestar bastante atenção, até porque está tá sendo possível de, de compreender em português também. A gente, então, vai exibir agora a fala do Xavier e voltamos para cá. Enquanto isso, vocês podem uh, ir colocando seus comentários, dúvidas, questões, tanto pelo YouTube quanto pelo Facebook, que eu volto para ler isso e também fazer a mediação aqui da nossa atividade. E aí, ao final, eu comento brevemente o que nós teremos de atividades nos próximos dias também. Tá bom? Então... Pessoal, podemos rodar, então, o vídeo da fala do Xavier. Thank you for being here today and for attending this exciting new edition of the Semana de Majem at Unicinos University. Please accept my apologies that I can't be there with you. A combination of bad health and coronavirus crisis have come together to make my travel impossible. Still, I hope that delivering uh, this digital talk might somewhat make up for my absence. I would like to begin by thanking those behind the Audiovisualidades e Tecnocultura Research Group, especially Sonia Estela Montaño La Cruz and Gustavo Daud Fischer for inviting me, and to Adriana Amaral for suggesting my name in the first place. This 18th iteration of the Semana da Imagem is loosely dedicated to the topics of, of, of experimentation and archiving. Their overlap and interfacing with the horror genre, especially what we have come to know as found footage, are topics that I've tried to foreground in my talk, which is more generally on the role and continued significance of found footage horror in our times. But before I launch into the remit and scope of this paper, let me introduce myself and my connection to this topic. I started for, uh, working for Manchester Metropolitan University in 2013 as a research fellow in Gothic studies, and this is where I continue to work today as a reader in English literature and film. Most of my teaching and research fall in the areas of Gothic studies, understood widely as the dark side of culture, and especially in contemporary fiction and film. 
I've always been interested in affective processes, in the ways that prose and film can influence our feelings from the generations uh, of moods and dispositions to the neurology of the shock moment. Upon my arrival and with the help of a few colleagues like Dr. Lini Blake, head of the centre, or Dr. Sarah Kenny-Line, we founded the Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies. The centre is dedicated to the study and dissemination of research in the Gothic from multiple perspectives, from literature and film to video games, fashion and architecture. As part of this research group, we have carried out a number of public events, generally under the guise of the Gothic Manchester Festival. This annual festival takes place in October of every year and sees us collaborating with Manchester cinemas, film festivals, libraries, students and the goth and steampunk communities. More recently, we have launched Haunt Manchester, a section of the Visit Manchester tourist site that lists all things spooky and mysterious happening in the city. We also had the immense pleasure of hosting the 14th conference of the International Gothic Association in 2018, which resulted in the biggest ever gathering of academics working in the field. I think we um, attracted over 300 academics. If you're interested in learning more about us and the work that we do, you can either follow us on Twitter, um, our ad is at GothicMMU, or you can join our Facebook group. You can also follow the link at the bottom of this slide um, for our website if you want to find out more about who we are and what we do. My wider research has been concerned with the role of uh, the body in Gothic horror film and fiction, with viewer alignment and with the different layers of cinematic affect and its connection to corporeality, as well as with the Gothic in the 21st century and with the difference between the Gothic and horror. Just to be clear, I understand the former as an aesthetic mode and the latter, horror, as a genre premised on emotion. I can talk about, uh, more about this later uh, during the questions if it's something uh, that you would like to discuss. Please accept my apologies for the self-promotion in this slide. I simply wanted to indicate with these book covers that I have explored larger issues about the form and effects of horror um, in my writing. As you can probably tell from my interests and those of my research group, it's inevitable that I'd be attracted to found footage at some point. I am particularly fascinated by how film manages to position our minds and bodies in situations where we might feel fear on behalf of or through the characters. The specular dynamics of found footage horror films with their emphasis on immediacy and their very similitudinous appeal to reality seemed like an interesting place to go in 2013. I was taken by Rec, a rare example of Catalan found footage horror that managed to cross into the international mainstream scene, and I wanted to explore the effective workings of the film in more detail. My colleague Lini Blake, who is more concerned with politics, wanted to explore the ways in which found footage may be seen to mediate national anxieties. So we came together and edited this volume, uh, Digital Horror, which tried to define a new type of horror film or what we called at that point digital horror, that is, quote, any type of horror that actively purports to explore the dark side of contemporary life in a digital age governed by informational flows, rhizomatic public networks, virtual simulation, and visual hyperstimulation. Further research led me to think through the then prevalent consideration that found footage horror was a subgenre. As I saw it and still see it, found footage is less a subgenre with distinct characters and settings and more a framing technique. A chapter I wrote in 2016 for the collection Snuff, Real Death and Screen Media investigated the moral dilemmas posed by the last horror movie, a 2003 found footage snuff fiction about a serial killer who involves the viewer in his murders. I must confess that I have not since returned to found footage specifically. However, I have taken this opportunity to muse a little more on this 21st century phenomenon and what might be happening to it in the 2010s. So, part one, the what of found footage horror or what is found footage horror? First, let me brush you up on what the found footage horror is, as well as its brief history. It's obviously not my intention here to provide an all-encompassing chronology or a survey, but rather to point out key areas of development prior to found footage's breakthrough moment in 1999 and its consolidation in 2007. 
as I hope to demonstrate, the very same concerns that arise out of uh, pre-internet proto-forms of thumb footage can be applied to the development of new ones in a digital age much more consumed with notions of immediacy and hypervigilance. Key to my take on the found footage phenomenon is its dissolution of frame and story, as well as its flirtation with notions of the real. As I just mentioned, although found footage has been called a subgenre by some critics and journalists, I prefer to see it as a framing narrative technique. The reason for this is that what characterizes found footage horror is not its theme or the source of fear, which may vary, but the film's mechanics, the way it is structured and shot. Found footage horror takes its name from found footage film, an experimental form of filmmaking that usually compiles, appropriates, or creates collages out of pre-existing photographic and or filmic materials. Good examples of this form are Bruce Connor's 1958 film A Movie, Ken Jacobs's Urban Peasants from 1975, and A Perfect Film from 1986. All of them reuse footage from different non-narrative sources, for example, an interview with Malcolm X, that is either represented with few changes and simply edited into a specific sequence, or may even be manipulated in post-production. The term, as applied to horror, has, come so, has become so popular that it has effectively replaced the former, despite attempts by critics like David Bordwell to distinguish the two by renaming found footage horror, uh, discovered horror, that was his term. Found footage horror is uh, called so because part or even the totality of a given film will be presented as found, that is, as not having necessarily been recorded for exhibition in cinemas. I will explore the implications and limitations of such a framing decision on the look and feel of found footage horror later. But for now, the key thing to remember is that, as their name suggests, these films aim to scare viewers, not to experiment with archival images. The other thing worth remembering is that there have been many of them. FoundFootageCritic.com, the most thorough and comprehensive site on this topic, lists over 700 films, nearly 800, since 1999. That's a lot of found footage horror films. Claimed by William C. Wees, the effect of found footage films, irrespective of, quote, whether they preserve the footage in its original form or present it on new and different ways, is, quote, to invite us to recognize their images as found footage, as recycled, end quote. Through this self-referentiality, quote, they encourage a more analytical reading, which does not necessarily exclude a greater aesthetic appreciation than the, than the footage originally received, end quote. With found footage horror, the emphasis is not on a type of self-referentiality that raises awareness of the original. On the contrary, the emphasis is placed in passing the fake as real, either to fool viewers into believing the material being watched is not fictional, or more commonly, to invite them into diegetic games. This has not precluded some horrors in this vein from including real elements or from blurring uh, the boundaries between performance and reality. In the case of some extreme horrors, the testimonial nature of found footage horror has in fact encouraged uh, an experimental, if not morally unproblematic, exploration of the limits of the permissible, for example, featuring consensual torture or humiliation. Like its conceptual brother, found footage horror also presents itself as rare, not as an impossibility, but as an improbability rescued from time. Most, if not all, of the characters in found footage horror will be dead by the end of the film or will have been involved in the demise of others. This makes found footage horror films evidentiary, by which I mean a source of incriminating evidence and instrumental in teasing out the mysteries behind them or behind their plots. In a piece about the effect of using archival images in film, Jamie Barron suggests that what the archival image offers is, quote, truth value and a sense of revelation. In his words, historical authority is conveyed by the fact that the footage is found and was not directly made by the director. In other words, this version of the past has not been filmed from the vantage point of the present. In found footage horror, the film is deliberately manipulated to look truthful, often at the expense of cinematographic detail, but the interest is not, strictly speaking, historical. 
For those who believe that the event of the Blair Witch Project had really taken place, the film offered an invitation to view the tapes of the three missing filmmakers, to actually see them. For those who didn't, who didn't believe that the film was real, the film invited engagement with its innovative aesthetic and the pretense of its reality. So rather than term this the promise of truth, as in found footage cinema, which would indicate an honest contract between consumer and product, I would rather consider the narrative dynamic in entered here as being based on a premise of truth, which signals an awareness of the fabrication of the whole thing. This exchange is quite similar to what, in a different context, has been called the authenticity contract one enters uh, with reality TV, and this is um, Gunn Enley's term from 2015. It is hard to think that by the time of Paranormal Activity 3, released in 2011, anyone was still thinking that found footage horror films depicted actual events. This has not always been the case. However, and many films that paved the way uh, for found footage horror in the 21st century often invited, uh, even courted, controversy by parading uh, themselves as the real thing. The marketing campaigns for Snuff, a 1976 film with the xenophobic tagline that I simply had to share with me, quote, uh, with you, sorry, the film that could only be made in South America where life is cheap, and Cannibal Holocaust from 1980, both played with the inclusion of actual non-faked footage. Snuff, which was promoted as a snuff film, that is um, a film depicting um, a real death on screen, contained an appended five-minute acted scene where a female production assistant appears to be murdered and dismembered by the director and his crew. Producer um, Alan Shackleton, who had read about the rumored existence of these tapes in South America, decided to exploit the paranoia surrounding them. Fake protesters were reportedly hired to picket targeted cinemas, and eventually concerned members of the public joined in. Similarly, Cannibal Holocaust director Ruggiero Deodato asked his actors, presumably dead by the end of the film, to hide for a year after its making. The vast majority of his film is made up of The Green Inferno, a documentary about allegedly man-eating tribes in the Amazon rainforest. Before the crew members are themselves slaughtered, the film introduces viewers to the real killings of animals like a dog and a turtle. This type of technique, the interspersing of real death among otherwise fictionalized one, uh, to heighten the, the credibility of the latter, was also at the heart of Mondo films and of exploitation series like Faces of Death. Um, and that, that ran from 78 to 96. As with Snuff, the ploy was successful. The film was banned in many countries and the director ended up having to testify in court that the actors were actually not dead, they were alive. The Blair Witch Project, you can see one of its um, posters there, played a similar game, asking actors to use their own names and starting a website that purported uh, that they had gone missing. Alexandra Miller Nicholas, in her brilliant book, Found Footage Horror Films, expanded the history of this technique and its complicated connection to reality by showing how even ostensibly educational films, like those made by the Highway Safety Foundation in the United States, could be seen as utilizing the same approach. Cautionary tales about the dangers of speed driving in Signal 30 from 1959, Mechanized Death from 61, and Wheels of Tragedy from 63 resorted to actual footage of real road accidents. And the child molester um, from 1964 used a hidden camera to bust a group of pederasts in Mansfield, USA. I have already mentioned snuff fictions and actual death films have a long history going back to at least Thomas Edison's Electrocuting an Elephant, an actuality film that nevertheless clearly spectacularized the execution of an animal. There have also been rare attempts, as in Michael Powell's Peeping Tom from 1960 and the last horror movie, which I've already mentioned, to make metafictional films about the making of snuff films or tapes. This tend to mix um, two camera confessionals, so, you know, confessionals made to the camera, with point of view footage from the serial killer's point of view. Part of their appeal is the implication of the viewer, whose involvement and desire to watch the serial killer voyeuristically aligns one with the other. 
Finally, a clear precursor to found footage horror as we now understand it, are programs apparently broadcast live on television, which in the style of Orson Welles' famous broadcast for the, world, the, the War of the Worlds, turn out to have been staged. Ghostwatch from 1992 continues to be a point of reference with its elaborate hoax about a ghost that eventually possesses real British TV presenter Michael Parkinson there in the bottom picture. It sparked a real furore with complaints from the public made against the BBC. As you can hopefully see, the cultural underpinnings of found footage have deep roots in screen history. Despite this fundamental prehistory, what we currently think of as found footage horror has been mostly shaped by a string of successful independent films in the 21st century. Above all, the surprise mega successes of the Blair Witch Project and the first paranormal activity, both of which were made for less than $100,000 but made millions, are responsible for laying the grounds for its main formulae and aesthetics. Blair Witch cemented the pseudo-documentary, found text dynamics, and the use of night vision, while paranormal activity introduced surveillance recording technology. Later films, such as the also very profitable Unfriended, began to tell their stories through webcams and computer interfaces. This slide shows other significant contribut contributors to the craze. I've emphasized total grosses because one of the main appeals of found footage horror is naturally massive returns on micro investments. The pervasiveness of found footage is evident in the fact that even George A. Romero, director of um, Night of the Living Dead, felt tempted to experiment with cinema verite and multi-camera uh, feed in the fifth of his Night of the Living Dead series, uh, Diary of the Dead, from 20, uh, 2007. I have pointed out that found footage uh, horror is thematically very varied. Beyond ghosts and hauntings, which are perhaps the most common, found footage has also yielded a number of monster films in the style of uh, Godzilla from 1954 and The Mist from 2007, and demonic and possession films that borrow significantly from previous blockbusters like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. Many pseudo-documentaries like Il Mistero di Lovecraft or Road to Hell from 2005 and The Borderlands, British film, also involve secret cults and sets that report the reporters infiltrate and investigate. Since supernatural phenomena require higher budgets, uh, you know, CGI and so on, many have favoured serial killer films, which can be even cheaper to put together. More recent films have turned to the dangers of the internet from the type of isolationism it fosters, something that had already been explored in the Japanese film Cairo from 2001, to the unregulated circulation of harmful content. The making of the pay torture and snuff videos and the illegal contents hosted in the encrypted dark web. However, where found footage horror truly innovated was in its experimentation with narrative. Found footage horrors will be either exclusively or predominantly made up of footage uh, retrieved from one or more sources, although these are usually either personal tapes or recordings made by reporters and will be edited together by an external hand, generally the police or an investigator. They can also be pseudo-documentaries, that is, pretend uh, pretend documentaries, reality TV, or combinations of both, as in Noroi, The Curse, from 2005, the Japanese film. They may even include still images, and as in uh, Sandman or s &M Man, uh, interviews with real people playing themselves, like real horror critic Carol J. Clover um, in one of the pictures on this light. Reporters going solo or, uh, on unsolved or suspicious cases are particularly popular as this plays up to the genre's interest in suspense and threat. The fact that these enterprises are secret or aim to uncover some truths uh, means that there is no one um, who may come to the rescue once things get really, really messy. And again, another key trope of horror. The framing of found footage has a number of implications for the look and feel of the horror films that use it. The inclusion of handheld or fixed surveillance cameras, both of which lock our point of view and reduce it to either alignment with what one character sees or else with a static feed, is anathema to commercial cinema. The latter has traditionally emphasized the importance of cinematography, depth of focus and cross-editing. 
It is important not to view found footage as a limiting technique, for films have found very interesting ways of overcoming the premises con constraints. From expert use of off-screen space and auditory cues that may concentrate our attention to more elaborate ruses, like the camera on a pivot in Paranormal Activity 3. Um, got a, a picture of that on the slide there. The camera sort of like moves to the left and to the right, and you know the ghost gets closer with each movement of the camera. In the cases where handheld cameras are used, action is more immersive, as in, um, as in the words of uh, David Bordwell, the images appear as unfiltered or pure subjectivity. A film like Wreck never actually shows its cameraman, Pablo, who also remains quite passive throughout, uh, so as to better create alignment between camera and viewer. As the director acknowledged when talking about the sequel, Rec 2, live reporting and reality TV were as influential uh, to the directors as the type of, of embodiment in first-person video games uh, that, you know, that, that they liked playing. In those films that rely uh, on static feed, camera-bound um, restricted knowledge can also be put to good use by, for instance, obscuring our view or giving us mere glimpses of things. The low-budget aesthetic is another defining trait. Um, even expensive films like Cloverfield have to be made to look amateurish. Again, this is not incompatible with artistry, but it does pose certain challenges as far as lighting, positioning, camera angles, and other important shooting factors are concerned. The footage uh, will normally come from handheld cameras, phone cameras, webcams, surveillance feed, and VHS tapes, all of which are used more pragmatically than uh, artistically. Ultimately, authenticity and immersion trump everything else. The omniscient camera does not need to be justified um, in traditional cinema, but in found footage horror, it is there in the action. It is diegetic. It, it, it's not just its existence, uh, you know, why is this camera here and who is carrying it, that has to be legitimized, but also its protracted recording. Why is this thing still on? Finally, found footage horror is internationally appealing, probably due to its low production and casting costs, as Mike Wilhelm has argued. Whichever the reason, virtually every major national cinema-making country, from Japan to Norway, uh, has made its own found footage films. Even Brazil produced its own pseudo documentary horror, 2011's Independent Desaparecidos, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, the first part of this talk has hopefully served two functions. For those of you who, have, uh, who are vaguely familiar with found footage, I hope to have better introduced this filming technique, especially its relation to reality and experimenting. This is not a horror conference, so I didn't want to assume any prior knowledge. For those of you who are already familiar with these films and may have um, even seen a few of them, I hope to have systematized and contextualized them a little better. What I want to do with the second half of this talk is to concentrate on the areas of interest that arise from the mechanics of this filming technique. I have talked about how found footage horror has overcome potential cinematographic restrictions imposed by its found amateur premise, but I have not thus far granted any space to how films more directly tackle concerns about the role of recording technology in an era marked by immediacy, the attack on truth, and the predominance of the image. Let me turn to this. I've called this section uh, Why is Found Footage Horror or The Why of Found Footage Horror because I read the rise of found footage horror as symptomatic of 21st century concerns. In other words, I think found footage epitomizes the pitfalls of the digital age, that it mediates its core anxieties, especially the overvaluing of the image and its ultimate crisis as it becomes increasingly unreliable. The 1990s and especially the 21st century have seen a democratization of the process of image capturing technology, especially the rise of portable video recording. Handheld cameras have been around for a long time. But the popularity of the video camcorder in the 1980s and its transition uh, from analog to digital in the 1990s, as well as the development of digital video recorders or DVRs for mass home storage, uh, became largely responsible for the ubiquity of everyday footage. The first camera phone, the Kyocera Visual Phone VP2, 
210 was released in Japan the same year as the Blair Witch Project and the first cell phone with a built-in camera in Korea in 2000. These pioneering phones were capable of storing roughly 21st pictures each. Groundbreaking at the time, can you imagine? Things moved really fast after that. Uh, in 2001, cell phones met the internet for the first time, with the first commercial 3G networks being introduced then as well. But by the end of 2004, two-thirds of all phones sold worldwide were already camera phones. That's, you know, crazy to think of. 2007 could be labeled the year of the smartphone revolution, with the marketing of the first iPhone by Apple and the introduction of unlimited data use. Both of these made it, made it easier to communicate live through the internet, especially through webcam and camera phones, and to capture high-definition videos. Let me dig a little deeper on the importance of immediate or live videoing, especially its perception as both terrifying and reassuring. It is worth remembering that for all that the terrorist attacks of 9-11 were preceded by the televisation of the Vietnam War, the former unfolded in real time, on live television. Um, as the aftermath of the first plane crash on one of the Twin Towers was being reported, another plane crashed onto the second, and soon after, both buildings collapsed in front of TV and personal cameras. This immediacy had many repercussions, but the main one, of course, was that images uh, reached people before the actual information. This was both a source of horror, what the hell was happening and when would it stop, and, as has been pointed out, a weird source of comfort insofar as it gave uh, some people the illusion that they understood what was happening. And these are not my words, they're uh, Burke's, uh, Joanna Burke's words. As Engelhardt has suggested, another striking aspect of these events is that they were, quote, imagined before they happened, with many journalists reporting that the attacks felt, quote, like a movie, like something they had seen before at the cinema. The destruction of major cities in disaster, alien and horror films had, in a sense, preempted 9-11 and offered the visual code for it. In other words, um, the discourse of horror filtered out reception and consumption of the images. It makes sense then that while heroic films like United 93 uh, from 2006, World Trade Center also from that year, and the political documentary Fahrenheit 9-11 2004 focused on bravery and accountability, um, horror as a genre concerned with channeling social anxieties captured the fear. Films like Mulberry Street and uh, from 2006 and Cloverfield, for example, are told through TV reports and handheld camera footage. There are also stories of people caught by surprise in the middle of a disaster of major proportions. They also incorporate images familiar from 9-11 reports and documentaries, as you can see in the pictures there on the um, slide. Um, uh, the famous slow-moving crowd, especially as it crosses Brooklyn Bridge, was pretty much recreated um, for Cloverfield. These found footage horror films are not directly about 9-11, uh, but might as well be. So thinly veiled are their monstrous metaphors. The original videos became sources to emulate. They redefined, in Kevin J. Wetmore's words, found footage into an accidental form of cinema making that emphasized immersion in the events so that action was shot from the point of view of individuals running in the crowd. Fundamentally, the role of the image and its connection to fear also changed. With live reporting of 9-11, the visual medium trumped the written medium, and video documentation became key in capturing the moment, especially its horror and tragedy. This faith in the value and ability of the image to reproduce reality, objective facts and events, um, naturally translates into found footage horror in the form of its film's factual drives. Screen cards typically chart the date and time. Amateur or unknown actors, sometimes using their own names, um, play the role of every man and women, and the camera is acknowledged and spoken to, as well as treated as the only beacon of resistance. The image, or rather our consumption of it, also becomes complicit, ridden with guilt and shame. The reporting of 9-11 and of terrorist attacks necessarily reifies the purpose of terrorists by helping spectacularize their acts and ensuing collective panic. 
It follows then that found footage horror would be interested in exploring the role of the viewer in the remote experience of fear, especially in any potential titillation <clears throat> thereby obtained. Beyond the impact of 9-11 uh, itself, what we are seeing, I would contend, is a wrestling with ideas of reality and truth in a digital age. Found footage horror films are very often concerned with these notions. Notice, for example, in the top picture, how Angela Vidal in Rec challenges a policeman who asks her to turn off uh, her team's camera by shouting that, quote, we have to let everyone know what's going on here. As the film goes on, the camera becomes a form of empirical counter evidence and the only weapon the inhabitants of the quarantined building have against the government that has effectively buried them alive. This is why the film also takes the shape of testimonials of interviews to the various victims. The crew's mission goes from reporting a fire brigade's ordinary night to the only record of a truth that the system will work to conceal. The Japanese Noroi, The Curse, a film about a reporter searching for supernatural happenings, opens with an intriguing quote, no matter how terrifying, I want truth. In other films like Apollo 18, the footage is presented as classified material, as governmental cover-ups. That's also the case in the Bay. The videos themselves become countering messages based on what really happened and has been obscured. Paradigmatically, they also overwhelmingly end badly with the death of most, if not all, characters. Why is this the case? It could be argued that the reason for this is generic, as in, you know, down to genre, postmodern horror tends to conclude with a monster either victorious or returning. But I'd like to propose an alternative reading. We must not forget that for its call to verisimilitude, um, found footage horror is, after all, fictional. It aims to scare you by making you believe in it. It would be erroneous to suggest uh, that it operates as a simulacrum, um, for it ultimately doesn't replace an original, but simply fakes it for effective purposes. Like the gothic mode to which it is linked, found footage horror proposes a fictional counterfeit, in this case, a copy of reality. It could, like all fiction, uh, be called disingenuous, for it elicits the illusion of diegetic reality by copying its visual and narrative codes. The fakery behind the product is exploited by the films themselves. For example, in the film Creep 2, on the uh, first picture there, uh, the film is from 2017, the main murder sequence in the first film is watched by the intradiegetic killer in front of his new potential victim, who immediately assumes the video is a fake. So here, actually, we the camera is the other character watching um, the killer watching the video that he recorded um, in the previous film. So here, the actual fake is suspected as real fake within the parameters of a film which is consumed as fake. Critic David Roche has uh, captured the interesting paradox contained by found footage's uh, self-referentiality in an article on Diary of the Dead. He writes about how the film, quote, aims at making primary and secondary identification overlap when it shows the cameraman and woman shooting each other and thus introducing the two different camera feeds, as in the Blair Witch Project. Our visual alignment with the camera is not broken, but suddenly we become aware that the camera is embodied too, that a person who is not us is behind it. As Wetmore suggests, this implies a breaking of the fourth wall that is not quite Brechtian because it doesn't interrupt the narrative flow. Instead, it emphasizes the vulnerability of the person shooting the images. The fact that the camera's presence normally excludes the body of the recorder simultaneously establishes a sensorial alignment between camera and viewer, so that we may thus enter a complicitous game of appearances where cameras become both the narrative thread, that is, what keeps the plot progressing, and the source of narrative threat, of, enda of endangerment and discomfort. Um, the concern with reality and artifice speak to contemporary concerns about the value of reality. The ignorance of research that could be pernicious uh, to businesses is, of course, not something 
new. Science denialism reared its ugly head in 1953, when the American Tobacco Association silenced work revealing the bad effects on our health of smoking. And in 1998, um, official denial of climate change by the American Petroleum Institute. What defines our post-truth times is that personal opinion has now become more important than facts, which can be bent to accommodate one's opinion for either political or financial gain. There's been a lot of talk in the media about this in relation to uh, US councillors coining of uh, alternative facts. In Britain, we have experienced this in the shape of the Brexit debacle, and as the Netflix documentary The Great Hack posited in 2019, the possible impact that the now uh, defunct data company Cambridge Analytica may have had on the result of the referendum. With a denial of photographic evidence and data that doesn't suit specific purposes, Lee McIntyre warns, comes the denial of reality itself. And the possible development of authoritarian governments and coercive forms of political domination. The found footage horror's pursuit of the truth could be read as a fictional corrective, but the terrible end for its characters also highlights the, ineffic the inefficacy um, of resistance. I would also like to propose that found footage horror's interest in the dynamic between truth, reality and deceit is connected to changes in our capacity to trust what we see uh, in a crisis of belief in uh, the inherently truthful value of images. Notice the drop um, in a recent Gallup survey in Americans' trust in mass media, and the graph there on the top. It was 72% in 1976, despite the Watergate and Vietnam scandals, but in 2016, only 32% of respondents thought the media could inspire confidence. That's a massive drop. Part of the issue has to do with the rise of partisan coverage of news after the foundation of MSNBC and Fox News in 1996. As revenue from viewers um, becomes more important um, than any type of objectivity, skewed representation becomes unavoidable. For example, CNN reported that $1 billion worth of gross profit in 2016 as a consequence of Trump's presidential rallies. More people were uh, tuning in to Trump's outrageous messages, and this, in turn, led to the channel granting him more airtime. As McIntyre shows, the 21st century has also seen a concomitant decline of traditional media, especially newspapers, and a marked preference in the public for a confirmatory type of media. In a recent poll, 62% of US adults suggested they currently get their news from social media, with 44% overall admitting that they get their news from Facebook. It's quite scary. These channels do not veto content or filter out disreputable news sites, which makes it virtually impossible to monitor what is often passed as real information or journalism. With the rise in image and video manipulation, especially the recent concerns about deep fake technology, there where you can now sort of like um, essentially put someone's face onto um, a video and make it look realistic, the manipulated image will soon replace the real one. Found footage horror negotiates this skepticism towards the recorded image and encourages a playful and consensual engagement with its fakery. I've mentioned social media, and this is important beyond its capacity to act as a repository and spreader of misinformation. The development of fast and reliable broadband internet, of applications like Skype in 2003, alongside the founding of video sharing platform YouTube in 2005, of microblogging platform Twitter in 2006, and in the 2010s of photograph and video sharing platforms Instagram and TikTok, have all radically transformed the speed and fundamental nature of our communications. An image or video can now go viral in seconds, and it is possible to upload and send content of any kind instantly. Much has been written about the possible isolation, duplicity, and anxiety caused by an over-reliance on social media, but even more interesting to found footage horror has been the ways in which social media mediates and commodifies our lives, making people anxious over rises or decreases in likes, hits, or views. 
Similarly, the dangers expectant on anyone using the internet full of unregulated video content and anonymous users has taken the shape of extreme cases, uh, like those of Luca Magnotta's recording and uploading of his two-camera killing of a man. Also of the Tide Pod challenges in 2017, you've got a picture uh, down there. Um, this is when people were um, uh, daring each other to eat um, detergent pods, um, which is quite popular in, in Europe. Or the suicide of a little girl in the UK after being exposed to self-harm content on Instagram in 2019. Very important case here. In these cases, social media platforms have become enablers in the consumption of violence, dangerous dares and age-inappropriate content. Much of this um, has found its way into the later wave of found footage horrors, which uh, replace the camcorder as mediator and turn their eyes onto the dangers of the web and of unregulated image sharing. Megan is missing from 2011, about a 14-year-old girl abducted after chatting to someone online was based on real cases. Unfriended, a ghost story which unravels in real time uh, through the laptop of one of the characters, which becomes the interface itself, is an indictment of so-called revenge porn and humiliation videos, as well as a cautionary tale about the power of social media to destroy people's lives. Cam, from 2018, only uses found footage in a few scenes, but it mounts a timely critique of the objectification of women online, especially through pay-per-view camera chat shows that aim to control their actions. At the beginning of the film, the main character appears to kill herself. Now, this live death is revealed to be a ruse manufactured to help her place better in the webcamming ranks. But the act is a powerful metaphor for how sex work has become so much disposable flesh. A related point is made in Vlog from 2008, which returns to the snuff origins of much found footage. Unfriended Dark Web goes one step further by exploring the dark web, that part of the internet that remains unindexed by search engines and exists on overlay networks. The characters in this film manage to gain access to one such network called The River, which they discover is an on-demand snuff video ring operated by anonymous users. As its predecessor, the film takes place on the computer of the main character, Matthias, who uncovers a hidden folder containing the forbidden material. Or at least, that's what the viewer thinks. At the end of the film, as the main character dies following an online poll to decide his future, sorry for the spoiler, uh, the camera zooms out, and that's the image there on the top. Suddenly, we're transported to the room of one of the users or hackers um, who've been recording him, and we realize the film actually captured the feet of Matthias's uh, computer uh, remotely. It is an uncanny moment that pulls the rug from under the viewer's feet and which poses some serious questions about the perceived privacy and security of online video calls and content. We are living through times in which the extensive um, uh, use of CCTV has transformed our relation to surveillance. We now accept the constant presence of cameras in our lives. For the sake of illustration, the average person living in a big city is likely to get caught on camera an average of 70 times a day. And we're headed for a staggering 1 billion uh, worldwide um, CCTV systems by next year. This status quo has itself generated a massive industry, reality TV, based on the desire for unmediated truth and scopophilia, best exemplified by the sustained success of the Big Brother program. As Catherine Zimmer has argued, surveillance has become a narrative logic and privacy increasingly a premium were not a fantasy. Even our personal data of particular interest to businesses and political campaigns is at threat, as the 2018 Facebook scandal showed. Unfriended Dark Web is not just another film about the dark side of the internet, but found footage horror's way of reminding us of the erasure between the private and the public encouraged by the telecommunications revolution. So, let me see if I can come to a few conclusions. One of the main points I have been making is that the aesthetics and narrative of found footage horror as a framing technique has been shaped by crucial changes to the image following 9-11 and to developments in the recording, availability and sharing of videos. The democratization and immediacy of technologies 
um, and dissemination platforms have had an equal impact. At the same time, fan footage does not merely borrow, it also reflects back. The games of fakery and authenticity that lie at its heart are a response to a crisis of the image in the 21st century, a time when it has overtaken the word in importance, but equally has lost its credibility as mediator of the truth or of reality due to its susceptibility to manipulation. This objective truth has also manifested in deeply immersive, but also largely static forms of filmmaking birthed by the pervasiveness of surveillance practices that have become normalized, both in the private and personal spheres. I would like to leave you with one final thought that found footage may have, in turn, influenced documentary genre from which it developed. I am talking very specifically um, of the Netflix documentary Don't Fuck With Cats from 2019 about the ice pick killer Luke, um, Luke Magnotta, um, whom I've already mentioned in this talk. As you can see from the Netflix ad image, there was little indication from the poster or from the marketing materials that this documentary would be about the horrific murders of a maniac. The title is almost humorous. Um, evocative of silly cat videos that you might watch uh, online on YouTube? Well, not quite. The cats of the title are the first victims of Magnotta, who first gets noticed by a group of Facebook users who will eventually help uh, in his unmasking and they'll, they'll eventually get in touch with the police. The documentary plays more or less like a serialized found footage horror using interviews and feed from surveillance cameras, Facebook conversations, browsing searches, and even in what I think was a bit of a misstep, excerpts from the original snuff videos um, made by Magnotta and uploaded online. Given that the killer's aim was to become famous, whatever the cost, the documentary cannot help but give him what he wanted. In an attempt to escape this hypocritical stance, um, the filmmakers finally turn the camera onto the viewer, questioning our own complicity in this vicious circle of consumption of images of real death. It's an unfair accusation, given the sensationalist uh, note uh, tone of the piece, but like the found footage horror by which it has been influenced, it asks some interesting questions about the value, validity, and extreme importance of the recorded image in 2020, which can no longer, if it ever did, become uh, an objective archival object. And this is where it mainly um, you know, diverges from found footage. Found footage horror is not the most genuine or conscientious of filmic conceits, but it makes perfect sense that it has come to define horror in the 21st century. Hopefully I have shown you why that's the case. Thank you very much. We're back. Estamos de volta. Xavier, in the name of everybody who's watching us, uh, and Facebook and YouTube, we applaud you for your excellent talk. Uh, probably you, you would like to revisit it since it passed so many months to update some things since this genre has been growing the 21st century. Eu estou parabenizando o Xavier pela fala dele em nome de todos nós aqui que estamos assistindo e, e também imaginando que ele talvez quisesse acrescentar coisas considerado os últimos seis, sete meses. Eu vou fazer algumas colocações aqui agora, uh, inicialmente, para começar a nossa conversa. Já tem algumas questões chegando. Uh, eu vou dar início, assim, primeiro, enfatizando esse caráter muito completo da visão que o Xavier traz uh, dessa perspectiva do found footage horror, principalmente no sentido uh, com o qual a gente se interessa bastante aqui no grupo de pesquisa, de perceber as questões imagéticas articuladas com as questões tecnoculturais e contextuais. Uh, então, nesse sentido, uma primeira colocação minha seria tentar enfatizar uh, o fato dele falar em framing techniques, mas essa ideia do framing technique, na hora de pensar o que é o found footage horror, uh, vai para além de pensar nas angulações, uh, considera isso de câmera, os enquadramentos, as questões estéticas, mas também como isso é articulado com aspectos tecnoculturais ou contextuais, que vão da questão da pós-verdade, as mídias sociais, os vídeos virais, as questões dos equipamentos de gravação. 
talvez pudéssemos então pensar que essa ideia do framing technique, em termos de, é, de emoldurar uma experiência estética, esteja para além apenas do, do framing da imagem, mas esse framing de um contexto, né, de uma época. Esse é um, I'll soon translate this. That's fine. Uh, Carry okay. on. Uh, It's a lovely uh, language. <laughs> ok, thank you. Uh, o, o segundo ponto é uma indagação mais uh, metodológica, como para fazer esse, esse processo de, 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 de passar por esses elementos e, e encontrar esses filmes, o que, o que ele, como ele trabalha metodologicamente, né? Uh, e um terceiro ponto que talvez uh, ele, ele já queira falar a respeito é considerando então uh, o framing da, do nosso momento da pandemia e das imagens que emergem das tecnologias que nos fizeram é, ter que nos situar em determinados contextos em função é, das práticas de distanciamento mediadas pelas telas, né? O que isso está ou poderá repercutir nesse processo em andamento dessa genealogia do found footage horror, né? Well, um, Xavier, I have three points to, to, to talk to you about First off is the idea of framing techniques. Uh, can we think about the, the concept of a framing technique in your, in your way of approaching uh, found footage horror, not only in the sense of how f images are literally framed by the camera, like the point of view shot or the use of lightning or maybe the nervous camera and uh, the other examples that you gave us in this, these terms of the literal framing of who is filming or pretending to film, Uh, but also in the idea of a sociocultural or technocultural framing in terms of what are we experiencing in, as a society, as you spoke about post-truth and other issues as social media, viralization of films and other aspects in that sense, the equipments and the technology that it's... So if we can talk about the idea of a framing technique, can we put all this in the same package and at some point? This is one of our one of my, my questions. The other is more a curiosity about how do you approach these movies and the, and, and, and your research methodologically methodologically speaking. Uh, it, it looks to me like it's some sort of a cartography that you make uh, or that you did uh, with these with these movies. But if you can say something about how you work with them in terms of of how do you collect these images and and how, how and so forth. And the third point is. What can you tell us about the last seven months in terms of uh, COVID world, right? It's, it's not exactly a cover field uh, environment, but it's pretty close. <laughs> What we're living right now is as an invisible monster around us. And how do you think this will or is already uh, building uh, new uh, movies or fragments of movies? Uh, they are. We, there are stuff going going on and using the vertical approach of the the cell phone and other things like that. So these are just to warm up three three themes for you to to elaborate a little bit, and then I'll go to our chat room that we already have a lot of questions. Thank you. No problem. Um, can can we go back to the first one? That's the one I didn't quite get. The idea of technocultural um, framing. What did you mean specifically? Uh, the idea that. Uh, uh, Found footage horror is, is not the framing technique uh, beneath it, let's say like that. It's not only uh, aesthetical choices, but it's a framing of a vision that we are experiencing now of a type of things that are going on in context. It's like a foreground that helps to emerge these images. That's yes. Sort of a McL McLuhan approach, right? Figure and, and foreground. Yeah, I mean, I guess obviously thinking about it in in very simplistic terms is just the way that we shoot reality now. You were just talking briefly there about the vertical phone. I mean, um, I would think, and this is probably why we have begun seeing. Uh, when I started writing this paper in March, uh, I hadn't quite discovered the term the term desktop horror. This is why I, I referred to films like Megan is Missing as webcam horror, but this term desktop horror is beginning to be used uh, increasingly. And I think it just makes sense, you know, who who uses video cameras now unless they work in, in film and media? You know, we don't on a day-to-day -day basis. Our phones have uh, replaced uh, that kind of technology. So I think it would make sense that 
uh, as we see more and more convergence in the forms of media that we use, you know, a smartphone to be used for all occasions, um, that we see that sort of turn towards um, the, fr the the phone as framer or the desktop as framer as um, as as the thing behind it, because we interact with the world through our phones and through um, all of those uh, means of technology that that filter reality for us. It seems to make sense as well that that image, the image that we produce through the phone, is the one that's now uh, being being questioned um you know I, i don't want to get too political but one of the things that that has changed uh, in my thinking since march is i used to think um that that the image was in the beginning of a process of crisis now i am convinced that it completely is in a process of crisis uh, and what sparked this thinking is is the trump campaign um you know their, their insistence that they did not will lose uh, the, the vote and their insistence that there has been fraud in the election. And what makes me think that is um, Trump's approach to um, the world, which is, I want things to be this way. I will say they are this way, and then I will find the images to prove that that is what I said. And it began with his inauguration, and it begins now with fake videos of people doctoring votes. So I, I wouldn't say necessarily that found footage reflects maybe um, a distrust in the media uh, or, or Rather, I wouldn't say that found footage encourages a mistrust in the media, but that it reflects a mistrust in the media, and um, you know, and and the uh, the way in which we have completely beholden become beholden to the visual image um, as opposed to the piece of news as a way of interacting with reality. I don't know if that answers the first question. I've gone on a bit of. A <laughs> uh, okay, sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. Did you want to? Uh, uh e aí, a, 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 é, é, então, acho que ele, 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 ele trouxe como exemplo a, a perspectiva que sim, que a gente está vendo esse mundo mediado por esses telefones, essas tecnologias e outros tipos de equipamentos uh, acabam sendo usados para fins muito mais específicos do que essa realidade. E ele vem pensando nos últimos meses a ideia de you, you like the image is emerging from crisis. Is that the idea that you said? Uh, I thought the image was beginning to be in crisis. I think I am now convinced that it is completely ah. in crisis. <risos> a, a, ima a imagem estava entrando em crise, agora está convencido que está completamente em crise, considerando o contexto, por exemplo, da, da recusa do Trump em admitir a derrota e a geração de conteúdo, inclusive, é, estilo fake found footage, é, a respeito de manipulação da, da contagem de votos é, e assim por diante. Então, ele, é, ele vê esse período bastante consistente nesse sentido. I think the idea that I, the, the the words that were going through my head is bespoke manipulation of the image. So uh, when the image is manipulated, that someone's deliberate will um, and how it's come to replace um, any kind of indexical reality of the image. Are those are those sounds coming from your end? <laughs> uh, yeah, bespoke manipulation, manipulação sob medida, né? Essa ideia de uh, ser bastante preciso na hora de, 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 de modificar algum tipo de, de conteúdo. What about your methodological approaches? So, to be very honest with you, my approach to found footage initially when when I began looking into it in 2013 was purely effective. I was interested, as I have always been, in how horror manipulates your experience, your perception in order to draw you in in the first place, uh, make you care for the characters uh, in the second place and third, you know, to affect you in a specific way. And I was very interested in exploring it, you know, in 2020, having done all of that, it's sort of almost obvious how how um, that, that genre does what it does, you know, the use of the diegetic camera, the use of off space, all of these things that have become better known since I started looking into this then. Um, but increasingly, especially as a result of the invitation to be a part of this um, uh, Semana da Imagem, I began thinking about um, the, the, the reflectionist side of it. I think the type of um, methodology that looks at horror as a reflection of reality is normally called reflectionist. That's what... Um, Matt Hills has called it. And that sort of becomes my preferred option because um, th there's a tendency in um, horror studies to not really want to read too much into um, the medium or what, or, or, or 
trends that are popular. So there's this idea that um, horror is popular just because you make a film, it's successful, therefore more get made. Um, so there's that aspect to fan footage. But increasingly, I've become to think that that it goes beyond that, that it is reflective of um, how we, we feel towards the uh, recording of images. And the more I dug into it in, in my mind, the more I uh, began to sort of pursue this idea of the crisis of the, crisis of the image. And uh, yeah, I'm increasingly interested in how fan footage horror does not just articulate affect, um, but very much um, talks about the discourses of mistrust that we have, not just in uh, new media, but um, the, the media more generally, and uh, and definitely um, the uh, possible uh, doctoring of the image in a time when it has never been easier. You know, people can literally doctor images on their phones now. So on, okay. at the time when we rely on the image the most, it's also the same time at which we can manipulate the image the most. So it's it's in this tug of war between being incredibly uh, prescient and necessary to prove things, but at the same time completely uh, and utterly uh, mistrustful. I hope that makes sense. Okay, okay. Uh, então, assim, do ponto de vista metodológico, ele começou muito mais com interesse sobre como que essas imagens de found footage horror, de alguma maneira, criavam e chamavam a atenção das pessoas e criavam é, histórias fascinantes e foi partindo para perceber, até em função de, de colocar a imagem numa situação de crise, essa relação entre construção de verdade e, 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 e manipulação, ou mistrust, ou, ou desconfiança, que a imagem passa a produzir. E nesse sentido ele, ele defende uma, uma abordagem que ele chama de reflexionista, né? no sentido de muito mais pensar esse gênero como reflexo de questões que estão acontecendo no campo social do que eventualmente um gênero excêntrico. I, I, I kind of uh, interpreting interpreting a little bit here. So, uh, do people don't look at horror movies as something eccentric or something from the far side of, of the, the the realm of possibilities of stories, but much more a reflection of very concrete things that we are experiencing in our everyday lives. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Então, é, a perspectiva então do found footage horror é trazendo uh, esse olhar para o filme, para o gênero do horror como um reflexo de questões socio-tecnoculturais que acontecem e não como um gênero muito mais excêntrico e isolado, né? Um, what about uh, COVID content? Yes, yeah, me on nicely to your third question. I mean, um, the the surprise hit film of the year has been a desktop horror, Host. I don't know if people uh, have heard of it in um, in Brazil, but it's been really, really popular in the UK. Um, it, 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 it's about the, if not entirely, a British film. And it just makes sense. It also makes sense that whilst we were um, experiencing COVID, the most uh, watched film on Netflix was Contagion, <laughs> it, you know, a, a horror film about, um, you know, a very similar type of um, virus. So uh, to me, the two go together. I think that um, the rise of host, of course, is a result of the fact that it is now easier and cheaper than ever before to shoot a film. You know, literally all we need is to record this conversation and we've got a species of film going on. But at the same time, I think that sort of reflects uh, concerns that are specific to 2020, how we live in a hyper-connected world, yet completely and utterly isolated at the same time. And I think many people who have liked the film, like Kim Newman, for example, here, have celebrated that specifically, how the film manages to construct uh, a, an experience of isolation despite hyperconnectivity that is quite unique to uh, 2020. É uma das questões que ele destaca aqui dentro desse cenário, um filme como Contágio, por exemplo, no Netflix foi um dos mais uh, assistidos, né? mostrando talvez uma necessidade nossa de, de conviver uh, com a dimensão ficcional de um fenômeno que está acontecendo conosco uh, no dia a dia. Uh, do you think it's too soon to tell if, if new form... Uh, ele também mencionou a questão... Did you mention de desktop horror as well? In, uh, contagion... As no, con no, I, I ah, mentioned... Contagion is not... No, no, not a desktop horror. Although it is a, a weirdly short film that doesn't quite follow a linear narrative in places. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I used Contagion more as an example of a film that's reflectionist, how people seem to want to consume mm -hmm. a kind of horror that reflects their contemporary concerns. Yeah. Então tá, o Contagio como um exemplo dessa ideia de queremos ainda consumir nossas próprias situações uh, que estamos vivendo agora, não necessariamente então uma vontade escapista, né, de ir para outros tipos de... There's not only escapism 
in the interest of, of the of the spectator in terms of looking at fairy tale or I don't know Marvel movies or something like that. It's not the only option, and and probably Contagious shows us that the preference is way on the opposite. Yeah, clearly people. Oh. That. The other mention, the other film I mentioned is Host, which is indeed a desktop horror. Uh, ah, okay. The, yeah, that's the one that I was. Ah, da, ele... yeah. Okay, and ele mencionou também o filme Host, que que, que aí sim é do, esse gênero desktop horror que trabalha com essas imagens de interfaces e janelas que ficam é, andando né, dentro da narrativa, como também um sintoma desse nosso tempo. Okay, so I'll, I'll start asking questions from people. From uh, the students and people in general who are watching us. So uh, I'll first uh, read them in English here. So we have a question from Clara Moraes, which is a master's student here at Unicinos. Hi, Xavier. Good afternoon. You talked about many horror films that reassert the idea that the media lies and manipulates what is shown on screen. Do you think this can be an important factor for to people actually disbelieve the media and its credibility in real life? Então, a pergunta da Clara uh, vai na direção de pensar em nesses filmes de horror que uh, trazem a ideia de manipulação e, e, e da, da mídia mentir né, na tela. E se isso, de alguma maneira, seria um fator influenciador da nossa percepção e descrença na mídia. Né? That is a very good question. Um, I, I would have, five years ago, I would have said, yes, I agree with you completely. Now I am more tempted to think that actually uh, news media are under threat uh, as a result of the whole sort of like campaign has been launched against so-called left or liberal uh, media in the States. I don't know if you've seen uh, one of one of uh, Trump's key campaign uh, lines has been, you know, that the reason he's lost the, well, the reason that he was being impeached at one point, that he was, uh, you know, you know, the whole sort of like Russia interference thing, uh, that, that it had to do with an, a media, um, a news media that was effectively left socialist and that wanted, wanted him out of power. And what we've seen in the last week or so since the election is, again, that emphasis that um, the only reason he has lost the election is because the media have been against him and that the media are left and socialist. So um, <laughs> I, I would have five years ago, I would have agreed with that. Um, nowadays, I'm more tempted to think that actually it's the other way around. And what... Um, uh, desktop horror, um, found footage horror that, that focuses on, on the more newsreel type of approach does is show how under threat uh, news media reporting is from, you know, ideologies that will refute the truth. Um, uma, da, uma das questões que ele traz ao olhar, por exemplo, os fenômenos recentes e, e comparar a ideia do found footage é pensar que talvez seja o contrário, talvez... A, a, ele, sem, ele percebe sim que a ideia da, do jornalismo né, está sob tá sobre ameaça, é, mas que ao mesmo tempo ele pensa que o found footage de alguma maneira é, ajuda a mostrar a, essa ameaça e não, vamos dizer assim, reforçar é, uma percepção de que mídia equivale à desconfiança. Né? Então acho que é um pouco nesse... Eu estou fazendo traduções mais sintéticas, tá, pessoal, porque tem muitas questões aqui, eu também estou fazendo traduções... É, das perguntas aqui ao mesmo tempo, então, uma dinâmica bem interessante. Então tá, já fizemos a pergunta da Clara e da, a, da Clara, agora é, vamos para a pergunta da Ana Lu, eu vou começar lendo ela em português, a Ana Lu está colocando, também é nossa estudante mestrado, há um certo tipo de preconceito com filmes de gênero que vem diminuindo, nota o interesse de estudantes em estudar sobre e produzir academicamente cada vez mais embora ainda não seja recorrente encontrar em congressos de cinema estudos a respeito. Você acha que esse interesse que cresce é também fruto da possibilidade maior de criação com tecnologias portáteis? No sentido de que se há como produzir, há também o interesse em uh, pesquisar. So, Analu says, uh, there's a certain type of prejudice, quote unquote, with gender, gender films that has been, has been decreasing. I notice an interest of students in studying about and producing academically more and more, although it is still not recurring to find studies about cinema in cinema congresses or symposiums. Do you think that is this growing interest is also the result of the greater possibility of creation with portable technologies in the sense that if there is a way to produce, there is also an interest in research? 
That's a very good question. Uh, roughly, the answer is yes, I think so. Um, I think, yeah, definitely, the, the, the uh, democratization of the process of filming. I think also um, us make a difference. I think, you know, 20 years ago, you would have maybe struggled to find people um, at MA or PhD level who could support uh, the type of research that is now being done. So yes, on the one hand, I think it has to do with the medium. But on the other hand, I also think it has to do with the resources, the academic resources that are now there. So um, the, the last 20 years have seen a sea change, really, not just in the approach to horror and genre studies in general. It's become less of a dirty uh, type of uh, study, but also um, a rise of students to do it. And therefore, that perpetuates uh, the cycle of, of research. So, yeah, I would say the the, the foundation of the uh, Gothic Association, the International Gothic Association, was 1999. Uh, there are obviously precedents before that time, but from 1999 onwards, which I guess I haven't thought about it before, but coincides with found footage horror in a way, um, has seen the steady rise of horror filmmaking and horror production and therefore writing about horror. Yes, I mean... If if you look at the shelves behind me, all of this is like uh, horror academia. So definitely things have changed significantly in, in the last 20 years. I hope that answers the question. Sure. Uh, ele, ele gostou muito da pergunta e ele tende a, a concordar. Ele estava começando a, até pensando nessa perspectiva a partir da pergunta de que sim, nos últimos 20 anos, principalmente, né, não só a questão do, do, do meio possibilitar que houvesse mais pesquisa sem respeito, mas também a ideia de recursos nas instituições é, no sentido de sujeitos e, e, e programas interessados em, em discutir esse tipo de, de questão, e ele até pensou agora né, na ideia dos estudos góticos coincidir também com os próprios estudos de found footage, percebendo uma certa aproximação temporal no crescimento desses dois tipos de estudo. May I add something quickly as well that I just thought about? Um, I think another reason why this has changed is that gothic and horror Gothic fiction and horror film are essentially anti-establishment and they have been since the first Gothic novel was made in 1764. In fact, the Gothic is normally called the dark side of enlightenment, the irrational side of enlightenment. So I, I don't think it's a surprise that as people have become more ideologically aware and able, I think, to make up their minds about things, researching them themselves, rather than having things, you know, sort of like uh, uh, cascaded onto them, uh, that horror has gained more and more cultural ground. I don't think that horror as a genre is necessarily any lesser uh, than any other type of genre. In fact, I've said in my work before, I think it's the most honest of genres. So I think what this also demonstrates is that people have become more aware of what horror really does, which is not exploit things for the sake of money, uh, but very often reflect the the, the real fear, um, you know, that goes through the decades. And you could just literally run studies of um, what horror films have been popular decade on decade and map them on very clearly to social political events. Ele quer reforçar a ideia dessa vinculação do da ascensão do, 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 dos gêneros de ou dos, da, da, da própria história dos filmes de horror a eventos uh, sociopolíticos, socioculturais. É, e no sentido também de pensar que os estudos de góticos eles têm muito a ver com uma espécie de outro lado do iluminismo uh, e mesmo a ideia de é, ser um pouco é, anti-establishment, né? o que parece também né, algo que, especialmente no século XXI, se constitui como uma força é, talvez oposta a reações também conservadoras que a gente tem hoje em diversos outros segmentos. Né? All right, since... My, my Portuguese is, is going through, is coming through, right? <laughs> it's amazing. I don't know how to do it. I know how it is to translate live. You're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Anna Acker. She, uh, she wrote in English. Hi, Xavier. Yeah. Great lecture. As Hollywood images could have inspired the terrorism attacks, found footage archive can be explored by both post-truth illegal actions. I wouldn't say that um, horror inspired 9-11 um, attacks. I think um, the discourse, so I think horror films have replicated that kind of destruction uh, before. Um, I don't think they preempted or caused 9-11, uh, but I see what Anna is getting at here. You know, is there a, an ethical element uh, to to horror and how, um, you know, it sort of creates possibilities that then happen? 
I don't know. I would think that it was. It wouldn't just be horror that did that. You know, action films have done have seen very similar distraction. You know, scenarios. I'm thinking of Die Hard, which is not a horror film and plays out a very similar scenario. So um, I don't know. I, I I tend to do the opposite and think that um, horror reflects those concerns. So in a sense, I, I would be more interested in looking at how horror was affected by 9/11, as I tried to do briefly in that. Um, in that lecture, then sort of argue that there might be some sort of ethical uh, element there, you know, that horror produces horror, because that takes us back to 1980s, you know, debates around, you know, uh, is it if a child watches a horror film and they replicate it, is is the the filmmaker uh, to be blamed for it? I don't know whether that's what quite what Anna had in mind, um, but. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say probably more the other way around. Um, anyway, I wanted to say, because I, I know Anna on Facebook, I wanted to say hi to her and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, então, ele trouxe, ele, ele entende um pouco no, no outro viés, assim, ele está mais interessado em pensar é, como que os eventos uh, ocorridos, como 11 de setembro, por exemplo, refletiram, ou passaram a refletir uh, na, no, no gênero ficcional ou no gênero do found footage horror, no sentido de não tentar pensar numa, numa reflexão tão uh, uh, de, conse de consequência entre né, existir o, o gênero de horror e ele construir um determinado tipo de acontecimento na, na vida real, senão a gente voltaria para os anos 80 e aquela ideia de não deixar as crianças assistirem determinados conteúdos por conta de que isso poderia produzir determinadas reações. Uh, I remember in Brazil, uh, a, a movie from Sylvester Stallone, Cobra, uh, it, 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 it coincided with a, I guess, some murder in a, in close to a cinema, and then they 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 could they they closed it for for people under eighteen to watch it. I remember because I I I was able to go with my friends before that happened, and we were we were very proud that we would get the chance. To, <laughs> a, a, a terrible movie, right? A terrible movie, but in the sense of the idea that a movie. Is uh, is is the the cause of uh, this, yeah. uh, something that happens in real life? Uh, um, agora uh, a gente tem uma pergunta da Flora, né? Uh, também é nossa estudante de doutorado. Um dos aspectos que ficaram marcados da tua fala foi a relação que você faz entre filmes de horror, como os de ataque alienígenas e código e os códigos visuais que eles fornecem para o imaginário. O cinema busca no contexto e ao mesmo tempo fornece contextos ao imaginário. Você traz isso na segunda parte, a partir dos ataques de 11 de setembro, quando fala uh, sobre o caso do documentário Don't Fuck With Cats, onde o estilo found footage é útil. Uh, eu acho que é mais um... It's more, it's more a comment from, from Flora, anyway, I will translate it here. Um, let me just do it here. So... I might thank Google as well for help helping me today. One of the aspects that were, that uh, was in your to make between horror films such as those of alien attacks and the visual codes that they provide for immigrants, but uh, for the Im 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 imaginary, not immigrants, the imaginary, uh, uh, that cinema seeks in context at the same time provide context. The cin cinema film seeks context and at the same time provides context for the imaginary. You bring this up in the second part of your speech from the September 11 attacks. And when you talk about the case of the documentary Don't Fuck With Cats, where the fun footage style is useful. Um, I don't know if you want to comment anything around that. So we'll go. Yeah, sure. I'm not, I'm not sure I understood the, the gist of that. Would you mind? Repeating that for me. Sorry. Uh, uh, eu vou pedir para a Flora uh, tentar colocar se uh, ela tem, porque na verdade não apareceu aqui uma pergunta, pelo menos eu não consegui entender. Então, se tiver mesmo uma pergunta ali, pode reformular ali no chat para a gente, tá? Uh, I'll ask her to, to formulate as a question. There was not a question in, in place, so if she would like to reformulate that. Um, so we have now a question from Juliana Quitz, also a master's student here at our program. Uh, good afternoon, Xavier. Great talk. I have two curios curiosities. Since the beginning of uh, the year until now, did you map something about found footage related to the pandemic and isolation? I guess you sort of mentioned that. What if you, 
What if you identify the use of found footage in other formats in addition to films and series, such as the social networks that support the video? Uh, if you found the use of found footage in other formats uh, beyond films and series, such as, uh, I don't know, maybe videos on social networks that use uh, the video a, 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 as a medium. Because most so of I your examples are around film and TV, right? So maybe the, these formats that are only going on in other in other mediums, not not as television and and stream platforms. So uh, I have two answers to those two curiosities. <laughs> um, okay. The, the first one about the uh, the the type, um, and this I have to thank Sonia, the Sonia uh, Montagna, for 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 making me think about this. But it is true that uh, as the pandemic was happening, and we started getting those videos of I don't know if you had them in uh, in Brazil as well, but we got videos of people in uh, Australia fighting for toilet paper in supermarkets, and uh, people on the streets, you know, just just going mad with this. Uh, Sonia pointed out that how a, a lot of these images kind of traded on disaster movies and, and specifically zombie movies about a sort of like post-apocalyptic end of the world scenarios. And I think some of the discourses around COVID, the kind of alarmist uh, media, shall we say, the media that was interested in creating a reaction rather than reporting facts, definitely fed off uh, that kind of, um, you know, those images of horror that we know well from films like Contagion, from films like zombie films and so on. So I would say, yes, I, even, even the reporting, the style of reporting and the editing of those videos that we saw about the pandemic was definitely influenced by horror filmmaking uh, in, in trying to create specific, effective uh, landscapes for, for the viewer. So that's one thing. The other thing about... Um, where else found footage is manifesting. Uh, I, I haven't watched this film myself, but a friend of mine who also um, studies uh, found footage tells me that the latest thing is horror films, found footage horror films through TikTok. Um, so apparently there was one this year called Scary House, which I've not been able to uh, to watch myself, that took place via this influencer's uh, TikTok account. And the whole point was that it, it, that it looked real. People thought this person was really dying and, and something was happening to them and it turned out it was it was a ruse and i guess th that that once again sort of shows you how brittle the uh, uh, membrane between reality and truth is you know if you're living life if you if you're following someone else's life through their twitter account or through their tiktok account how can you tell reality from from truth not just in the context of them actually being alive or dead but how can you tell that their life is indeed their life and not a construction of their life the, the life that they want you to see então uh, respondendo a a, a, a pergunta, as curiosidades da, da Juliana, né? Então, no primeiro momento, ele enxergou muito, muitas das imagens produzidas por algumas uh, uh, emissoras ou canais de notícias interessados em criar um certo cenário é, meio apocalíptico, por assim dizer, para a questão da pandemia. Então, as pessoas correndo atrás de produtos, como papel higiênico e outros, ele considerou fortemente inspirado em filmes uh, de horror ou filmes de catástrofe, em que esse tipo de cena é recorrente, é, ligados a apocalipse zumbi e outras e outras questões do gênero. É, em segundo lugar, é, em relação a novidades e, e outros ambientes onde podem estar acontecendo produções é, que invocam a questão do found footage de alguma forma, ele, um colega dele é, trouxe um exemplo é, de um filme feito dentro do TikTok chamado Scary House, é, onde ele acha interessante a constatação dessa membrana bastante... É sutil entre o real e o, e o, e o imaginário, no sentido da, de, não no sentido de somente da, da desconfiança da, daquilo que está acontecendo ou não, mas a ideia da própria construção é, da vida privada, né, que acontece ali, não no sentido de que são ambientes onde a estrutura básica é você seguir amigos ou conhecidos, né, e isso né, certamente cria um tipo de uh, especificidade para esse tipo de, de formato, esse tipo de uh, situação. There was another, I just thought as you were saying that, there was another program. Um, I don't know if people are familiar in Brazil with a, a British TV series called Inside Number Nine, which um, is, uh, is, is sort of like a comedy uh, show run by the same people who did uh, the League of, uh, the League of, no, the League of Gentlemen here in the UK. And uh, anyway, 
sort of like a British comedy duo, but they sometimes do horror. And they did an episode this year that was mocking Ghost Watch. And the whole premise when the episode played was that you wouldn't necessarily know that. So the episode was, uh, they pretended the episode was being recorded live. And uh, halfway through the emission, the emission stopped. And there was sort of like 10 minutes of nothing on the screen. So people went on Twitter and the story continued in Twitter where the producers pretended that, you know, the whole thing was being haunted and that they had lost the image. So people who were then relying on Twitter for facts and truth were met with even more lies to feed the fantasy of that reality show. So I think that's a great example of how platforms have merged to the point where if... <clears throat> Excuse me. If the producers really want to blur the uh, difference between reality and truth, all they have to ask is, where do you get your truth from? And if the answer is social media, then social media becomes the platform to uh, to alter. Uh, what is the name again of the show? Inside number nine. Inside number nine. It, and is uh, uh, labeled as a reality show? No, it generally is a comedy show. Uh, uh, com okay elements but this episode was sold as a live episode uh, and ah, then okay. the it and you know the the image suddenly ended as if the transmission was being affected by ghosts ah, and then okay trying to check and obviously you know you have the producers and the, is that oh my god i can't find the entrance and stuff like that and people thought it was real ah tá então ele tava comentando desse programa inside number nine que é normalmente um um, um programa Uh, de, de, de comédia, mas que foi então uh, um episódio considerado como sendo ao vivo e houve uma interrupção do sinal, como se houvesse o sinal tivesse sido derrubado por alguma circunstância e as pessoas se fossem procurar nas mídias sociais do, do, do canal ou do programa, veriam os produtores ansiosos ou, ou comunicando uma situação uh, problemática né? trazendo um borrão de fronteiras entre fato e construção, né, e criando de alguma maneira até novas formas de narrar, né, o próprio programa em si, né. Então, mais exemplos que vem aparecendo desse borramento aí de, de fronteiras, de formatos e, e claro, de, de, de situações. Uh, I have a question now from uh, Amerian, which is also one of our master students. Hello, I've Xavier. Been, yeah. Uh, thinking about found footage horror and desktop horror, do you think that this absorption, adaptation, and insertion of languages from different media is a distinct feature of the genre towards others? Say that again, the last sentence. Uh, this absorption, adaptation, and insertion of languages from different media is a distinct feature of the genre, the genre of, of horror towards others. Uh, towards other genres or towards to, uh, towards other genres that's that's my interpretation here right uh, i'm not sure i, I, I understand that i question. was thinking <laughs> um it is somehow the uh found footage more adherent as uh to horror well that would be I my interpretation think, i think i think that found footage horror is going to prevail for two reasons. Um, one of them is that it's cheap to make, and uh, it, it has that, you know, it, the, the key for found footage horror is that it always looks real, that, that it looks uh, credible. And I think as we move towards uh, forms of, you know, as truth is increasingly built online, as we rely on the online world for our um, mediation of truth, it's only going to become even more the case. I've started doing a bit of a, uh, an, anal not an analysis, an early survey of how many desktop horrors exist, and they start shooting up from 2017 onwards. So there's, there's definitely a turn towards this type of horror. I think um, what will What will define it ultimately is whether we are capable of keeping that uh, premise of truth that I was talking about before. You know, the moment it becomes uh, something that's easily discountable, um, it will mo move into something else. I don't know what that will be because I don't know what the apps of the future uh, will look like. But found footage will keep jumping onto whichever platform or medium continues to pretend to mediate truth. É, ele entende que, que o found footage é, 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 um, é um gênero bastante, é, vem, vem se afirmando e tem, tem potencial em função de ser relativamente barato de ser desenvolvido, 
e dele essa preocupação em, em nos criar uma, uma condição de, de realidade. I, I couldn't get the number that you said you surveyed to, to take a number of, of desktop works. Yeah, I've noticed that there's an increasing number of films being made from 2017 onwards that look at the, ah, the okay. computer screens. Ah, ok. É, então ele notou também um aumento muito significativo a partir de 2017 de, dos filmes no, no gênero desktop horror, uh, e que é difícil, claro, prever o que pode acontecer para o futuro, mas ele sim concorda que é, tem, tem um modo... Uh, de construção do, do found footage horror que de alguma maneira atrai de, de, de produção de maneira recorrente, né? Uh, well, uh, I have one more question here from uh, uh, also Ana Ecker thanked your answer, okay? And then we have a question from Camila de Avila, uh, one of our PhD candidates. Uh, Olá Xavier, ótima tua fala. Fiquei pensando no seguinte. Se pensarmos em found footage nos games, uh, ele se daria na dinâmica que são analisados nos filmes e documentários? Especialmente pensando nos jogos que apresentam uma narrativa que dialogam com nossa realidade, seja por cenários epidêmicos, manipulações de dados ou vigilância, tensões que atravessam também nossas rotinas, entre aspas, jogam com a desconfiança sobre a realidade. Talvez uma espécie de sobreposição de medos ou de construtos de medo. Enfim, como pensar nesses aspectos olhando para os jogos? Se há uma diferença. Uh, well, she, uh, thank you for your, your talk. Said it was very good. And then she was, she's asking you about how do we look at found footage on video games? If the relationship that you are proposing uh, can be thought in the same terms with the same dynamic that you were proposing for films and documentaries, special, especially considering these games that present a narrative that uh, dialogues with our reality, uh, be that through epidemic uh, context, manipulation of data or surveillance, or other tensions that go through our routines and that somehow, quote unquote, play with our own uh, untrust towards reality maybe uh, uh, overlapping of fears or constructions of fear. Anyway, how can we think about these aspects looking towards video games if you see some difference? Uh, I would say that they're right. I think I, I definitely see that mapping onto video games, especially so-called stealth or survival video games. In fact, um, one of the ones I like to play is called Outlast. Um, and the whole point of the game is you only have a video camera that's your only weapon and uh, you have to escape all these different scenarios and the whole point of the film is that you have to record that what you're going through that's part of uh, the, the the key to the game and you have night vision that you must use in order to survive uh, the experience so i think some of these video games some of these stealth survival video games another one is um they recently made a video game of the blair witch which again sees overlap between video games. I, I think part of it has to do with witnessing, the experience of witnessing, and how these games force you to encounter the horror recorded and thereby prove it that it exists. So I think um, although the uh, interface may be different, the dynamic is very similar. Ele vê bastante semelhanças, especialmente em jogos, tem um tipo de jogo que ele gosta muito, que são os jogos de, 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 de escape, de, de fugas, stealth games, que trazem muito dessa... Uh, estética do, do, do found footage horror, e ele também lembrou que recentemente saiu um jogo baseado no Blair Witch Project, então essa ideia da experiência de testemunhar, de, de gravar, né, é, de testemunhar através da, do, do, do recording, né, do, do vídeo, como parte muito forte da, da digamos assim, dessa estética, uh, do tecnoestética e do, do found footage horror. So you see more similarities than differences. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, as with other medium, fan footage is going to keep jumping to whichever uh, you know medium allows it to to create a veritable experience. Obviously, what's different about um, video games is that they give you the illusion of choice. Um, you know, you have some agency in the process. You can point to one thing or the other. But a lot of these games are scripted. There are things you don't have complete freedom. You have to go through certain 
you know part of the game to get to the end of it so um you know they're really not that different from from the the, the films the experience may be different maybe more immersive but the end mm -hmm. point is the same and I, I think the focus continues to be on the the idea of witnessing i had not thought about this before this uh talk but now i'm thinking about the idea of digital witnessing and how found footage horror speaks to that so thank you That's given me an idea. <risos> <risos> ok, ele agradece porque ele não tinha pensado muito sobre essa perspectiva como uma ideia interessante de, de pensar nessa ideia do jogador te como testemunha ou o jogo como esse elemento que testemunha uma determinada realidade, embora ele reconheça que o jogo constrói situações é, de aparente escolha, de opções né, de visualização ou de mesmo de combinação de elementos, ele entende que o objetivo final é muito, muito semelhante. Né? Ok. Um... As I can tell you, uh, we have gone through. You, we were talking about uh, the length of of the Q &A, oh and A, and we are we are <laughs> almost reaching our time here. Uh, so, and I guess there's no. Uh, let me check again. Yes, there's no new new questions, and uh, I don't know if you'd like to comment on on something further or maybe comment about our dynamic here. I, I really just wanted to say thank you, um, especially to the organizers, to yourself and to Sonia, not just for the fantastic work that you did earlier this year, but for sticking with it, giving me all this support, you know, introducing, uh, translating all the stuff, making it all happen. It's a real pleasure to be able to be a part of um, the Semana da Imagem, and I, I've, you've made me feel very welcome. So thank you. Ok, ele agradece muito, né, a nossa, enfim, disposição aí, toda, todo o apoio que a gente teve aí na... na no desenvolvimento, na tradução do próprio vídeo e, né, nosso contato lá no começo, quero ter, eu agora, Gustavo, quero agradecer muito a Sônia por ter feito essa mediação com o Xavier lá no começo e também, claro, a Adriana, que nos deu a super hum, dica Adriana, desse, desse contato. <risos> é, e ficamos muito felizes. É, hopefully we can extend this partnership. É, let's hope for a vaccine soon, but if it doesn't uh, show up uh, too early, we can still uh, develop meetings like this one. And uh, Sony is very, very happy. She used the, the, the internationally known expression as querido uh, to say that you are very mm -hmm. welcome here. Uh, and uh, uh, eu vou apenas agora rapidamente mais uma vez agradecer todo mundo que nos assistiu hoje aqui pelo Facebook. Uh, eu quero lembrá-los então que nós temos amanhã, uh, dia 17, na terça-feira, com a mediação do meu colega Thiago Lopes. Uh, a participação do professor João Ladeira com o tema blockchains e criptomoedas, ruído, onipresente e arquivo infindável. O João, que já foi nosso colega da Unicinos e hoje está na Universidade Federal do Paraná. Na quarta-feira vai ter o Lucas Bambosi, que é um artista digital, enfim, um artista interativo, uh, muito, muito importante para falar do, do invisível ao redor, arte, espaço informacional, mediado pela Sônia. E na quinta-feira a gente vai ter cultura digital, a cadeia produtiva e o patrimônio audio audiovisual com a Inês Eisenberg, é, com a mediação da Sibeli Moraes. É, eu também quero agradecer muito os alunos que não só participaram e também os demais uh, que nos assistiram, mas também aqueles que atuaram no Twitter, como a Júlia Pinto de Souza, no Instagram a Juliana Ketz, na cobertura do site a Amelia Alves, nas interações aqui do chat o Guto Bozetti, auxiliando na transmissão o Lucas Ness, a Clara Moraes e o Leonardo Andrada, e a supervisão aí do grupo de mídias, junto com a professora Sônia da Camila de Ávila. Então, feitos agradecimentos da turma que interagiu mais, tem esse revezamento aí nos outros dias, mais gente vai participar do Ajuda. Eu quero mais uma vez agradecer todo mundo. É, Sônia, uh, saying that we learn a lot from you. Muitas graças. Ok, you're talking with her on the chat here as well. Uh, sim, por favor, <risos> Sônia, a little uh, merchandise here, please sign our newsletter em www.tecave.com.br. Uh, and uh, Javier, I hope we can talk soon, hopefully to read and watch you, uh, and we'll, we'll be in touch again. If you, you're more than invited to attend our uh, next uh, lectures as well. Thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Obrigado you. todo mundo. Estamos encerrando aqui o primeiro dia da Semana da Imagem. Nos vemos todos amanhã. Abraço.